What to read in to the Ben Simmons comments following a pretty embarrassing loss to the New Orleans Pelicans in the first game of the season. Going to talk about Simmons, going to talk about the rebounding, going to talk about some of Steve Nash's rotations as well. Going to get into all this, but first, the theme music. You are Locked On Nets, your daily Brooklyn Nets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, welcome back to the Locked On Nets podcast on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team, the Brooklyn Nets, every single day. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. And as Adam would say, where we start is with the Nets. I'm Doug Norrie, DF owner, owner and operator, excuse me, DFSR. If you need projections for FanDuel, and DraftKings, make sure you head on over to DFSR.com. Got you covered. Optimal lineups, everything you can need. Live chat, it's all there. Updating NBA projections in the second, in the moment. Go check it out, DFSR.com. Like I said, no Adam Armbrecht today. That's fine. Friday, we'll get into a little Nets action as we head into the weekend. As a reminder, we're going to be coming live uh, after following just about every Nets game live on YouTube. So make sure you subscribe over to the YouTube channel. Had a bunch of people in there following the loss to the Pelicans on uh, Wednesday evening. Even though the news on the Nets wasn't great, people wanted to fire it off. So make sure you subscribe over on YouTube to get yourself started over there. Really, really appreciate it. Where to start today? So uh, following the game, Adam and I, we know we did our post game podcast, and usually we wait for the quotes, uh, you know, in the post game pressers to kind of you know filter out so we can dive into them. At a later date, a day or two later, marinate a little bit on what happened with the game. And Ben Simmons was asked a bunch of questions following the performance that he had in the first game of the season, which was uh, less than stellar, 23 minutes, four points, five assists, five rebounds, uh, six fouls, three turnovers, a minus 26. You know, we don't go nuts with the uh, plus minus stuff in small samples. You know, Durant was a minus 23, but it all added up to Simmons being bad. There's no other way to put it. First live game, right? Excuse me. First live regular season game action for him uh, since the playoffs. Of, you know, I guess that's not regular season, but you know, if we're not going to count the preseason stuff, this was the first time in a game that really counted, and the overall performance was underwhelming to say the least. It was, uh, it was just a problem. So he was asked a bunch of questions about how the game went. And Simmons, you know what? He's not. It's not. There's only so much you can say. We don't. I don't want to read so much into post game stuff because emotions are high. These guys probably during these times answering questions with the media is about the last thing that you want to do. So I, I totally get it. Uh, you know, but sometimes you can, you know, make some determinations, look at what someone said, and to see where their mindset is. And so a couple of things that Simmons said were. Um, not of the excuse variety, but we're just kind of what happened here. He was said he was trying to set he quote, trying to set a tone on defense and he couldn't be as physical with Trey Murphy, which I think was a shot at, you know, who some of the fouls that he was getting called on went towards. And some of you know, were all these fouls legit? No, probably not. Some were of the ticky tack variety. These are my words, not his. Uh, and you did see a few times where the Nets didn't probably really appreciate how the refereeing was going. Some of that's going to be born out of frustration when you're getting it absolutely handed to you in a game. So it's you know hard to know where it all stems from. But uh, there was clearly some, you know, some being upset with the with the officiating here. Can't use the officiating as any kind of excuse for why they lost. And Simmons goes on to say he felt too excited. I felt good physically. There was some cramping at half. Uh, you know, by that point, the Nets had cut it to within single digits and um, it didn't look that great, you know, coming out of the gate in the second half. And then he goes on to say about his offensive aggressiveness, your mind tells you to go do something, but the body just won't go do it, which I think is an interesting kind of way for Simmons to look at this game. A ton has been, or you know, his game in general, a ton has been made about Simmons on the mental side of the ball. This was a big talking point for his exit out of Philadelphia from last year. It's been something that's sort of been with him 
since he entered the league, or at least when everyone started noticing that the shot really kind of wasn't coming around, it'll probably be a talking point the entire season if there's you know not a desire or an ability to get the shot off in times where the Nets probably just need him to kind of keep his foot on the gas on terms of the offensive side. I You don't see too much in the way of making excuses here. You don't see him taking a ton of ownership either about what happened in the game. Again, I, I you can't go crazy about it, but this might be a theme that we see with Simmons as time goes on. We've seen him talk in the offseason about where the game is, uh, about where the detractors are in terms of you know his game and where the limitations on his game are. And as long as there's going to be games like this one, which are high profile and completely underwhelming, these questions will be continued to ask of him all season long, uh, even probably following good games. It's not going to be, you know, there's not going to be much of a reprieve for Simmons on the, you know, on the reporting side or on the um, just kind of talking point side, because this is just going to be something that hangs with the team. When Nash was asked about Simmons, uh, and, and the performance Nash, and this uh, comes from our friends over at Nets Daily. He said, I think he's just rusty. The guy hasn't played for over a year. Uh, he's referring to regular season games because obviously he played, I'm parentheses here. He obviously played in the preseason, still getting used to the referees, the defense, the offense. This is a process. Uh, that's what Nash said. And then he went on to say, you guys heard me say it, but he's shown some obviously gl uh, glimpses of the player we know he is and he can be, but it's not easy. We're here to support him. We're here to push him, coach him up and try to get him to a place where he can play at the level he's played in the pla in the past. It's all there for him. So, I mean, I don't know, you know, are these the most encouraging signs coming out of the first game? No. Do you want these guys to fall on some kind of sword after one game and 48 minutes of basketball or for Simmons, 23 minutes of basketball where he, where it just didn't go well? No, you're going to have stretches. You're going to have 23 minute stretches during the season where things look bad. It's, you know, totally reasonable to expect that things wouldn't look super fresh coming out of the gate. It's a little harder when you look across the court and you see Zion, who also took a year off from basketball, look like he had never left the court at all. Um, so if you want a comparison, as Adam and I talked about last night, it is a little rough to see another guy who looks like the game didn't slow down, or excuse me, didn't speed up for him at all. In fact, it might have looked, might have been slowed down. Maybe the Nets offered the perfect chance for him to sort of showcase his skills and what he can do. But Zion looked fresh as a daisy and Simmons looked rustier than a rust bucket. I like it just, it, it couldn't have been any more uh, disparate in terms of how these two guys looked in, uh, on the court. I do think it's going to be worth it for us to probably follow along with some of these comments that you know, some of the talking points around Simmons, I think it's pretty much unavoidable at this point. And it's some, it's just going to be a part that we'll probably have to dive in like every game to see, you know, where the mentality is, where the mindset is, if are things kind of clicking, a lot of the times we'll see it on the court at like Nash Ed, it's up to them to be able to coach it up and, and get everyone into a system that is going to make it so that everyone can thrive. But in terms of like the excuse making, in terms of where the Nets maybe see themselves here, where Simmons sees himself after a really, really poor performance, it, it won't get easier from the talking point standpoint from, you know, the bulletin board material. It's not going to get easier unless it really gets proven for long stretches of time, multiple games where the Nets look really, really good until that happens, until the Nets are able to string together multiple good games with multiple you know, plus performances from Simmons specifically, this is just going to be something that keeps coming up. I, uh, it's not something we welcome, but you have to just, you have to live with the reality at this point. Like after you come out and play like this, where it looks frankly as bad as possible, uh, definitely on the offense event, as bad as possible, it's going to take time to, it's going to take time to undo it. I don't mean, even mean it's going to take time for like Simmons to get back into full game speed. That's obviously to be expected to some degree, but the questions around this and his needing to probably answer for some of it, it's just not going to go away. It'll be really interesting to see how this unfolds. Cause remember the nets do not have an amazing schedule here <laughs> to start the season. We've been over this multiple times around how the early season schedule for them is tough. It's just, it, you know, they got to play the Raptors here on Friday, which is in, not a great matchup. They got to play Memphis, even Memphis, Losing some guys looked really strong in the first game. They got to go play Milwaukee again after the preseason game. And then they got to play Dallas. Like this is a really, really difficult five game stretch 
with some very tough defensive assignments for Simmons specifically. So it'll be interesting to see how it shakes out and what Simmons's words are going forward, because you know what, this is probably not something that we can, this is not going to be the last time we talk about it. All right. We're going to talk about some of this other stuff with the rebounding specifically talk about some of Nash's rotations. Also first, going to tell you about our friends over at bet online bet online has you covered your number one source for all betting information this season if you need it for football obviously with basketball they have you covered no early line right now up on the nets uh right now the sixers only three and a half favorites over the knicks for uh that's i'm looking all the way ahead to december bet online our friends at bet online have it all the way to christmas pushing out right now that's how on top of this they are they're throwing the christmas day games up for the basketball, even though the Nets aren't going to be playing. Bummer. Uh, on that front, Bet Online is, like I said, your number one source for all player developments, team matchups, news, podcasts, in depth analysis on every single game. Uh, they have, it's not just, uh, excuse me, NFL and NBA either. MLB as they roll through the playoffs. Maybe you're into MMA. Go check Bet Online out. Uh, they're just your number one source. They have you all covered. You head on over to learn about all the different trends, all the different action. Bet Online where the game starts. All right. Talked a little bit about this yesterday. Going to dive in a little bit to more into the numbers here. Nick Fay uh, had a great tweet over that kind of crystallized some of this that we saw uh, in terms of the rebounding problems last night uh, two or two nights ago. If, if you're listening to this Friday morning, Nets, uh, second chance points for the Nets, four second chance points for the Pelicans, 36. Uh, if you want one stat that can pretty much sum the game up for why the Nets ended up losing by 22, this is a pretty good place to start. They got brutalized on the offensive boards. In general, the rebounding edge went 40 to 30 in terms of the Pelicans. And then on the offensive one, as bad of a discrepancy really as you'll ever see, 21 offensive rebounds for the Pelicans to just nine for uh, the Nets team or you know although nets need a slow center truthers out there of doing a, a weird victory lap on this one today i'm sure i've already seen it mentioned to me multiple times that you know if we just had old slow andre drummond here that we would or dwight howard or whatever we wouldn't be dealing with this rebounding disparity i, I mean I, again we've answered this question a million times i think this is going to continue to be an issue probably for the nets over the course of the season I, I still very much believe that as a team, they are probably willing to live with this to some degree if the defense can be really locked down, can, making for very difficult contested shots from the opponent, and then living with where the rebound edge is because you're causing some havoc on the defensive end. I do think that that is at the core of what the Nets want to do defensively. Uh, defensively, it's you know, in the first half, they, they held the Pelicans to 58 points. It wasn't like New Orleans went totally bonkers here. I know it looks worse because at the end of the first quarter, it was 32 to 14, and you're already in this 18-point hole, and you wonder if the Nets actually even realized that there was a game that started <laughs> to, to start the season. So mentally, we're like in a rough place with what we think the where the Nets were, you know, just in terms of performance. Remember... They they it, defensively, it just didn't look too bad over the course of the of the of the first half. Right. They had cut it to double digits. They held them down their 55 points. That's a fine place to be. It got away from them in the second half. And I do think that, again, with this with the personnel that the Nets are running out there with Claxton starting with Sharp coming off the bench when the opposing matchups are going to trend on the bigger side. I still think the rebounding edge is probably not going to favor them. I still think that's probably okay. I think you can lose marginally uh, on the on the boards, specifically on the offensive boards, if your goal is to get out in the transition, if your goal is to get into cross matches for KD and Kyrie on the other end, that you sell your soul a little bit on the offensive glass or through the opponent's offensive glass or you on the defensive glass. You sell your soul a little bit for the, the gains you can make when it does go your way for the gains you can make when Ben Simmons gets a rebound and can push the pace, right? When you, when you can't even get Claxton who's you know developing into a decent outlet guy uh, into a situation where he can push, they, they can start pushing the pace because he can outlet to one of the guards like Kyrie or even KD or obviously Simmons. I think in general, you can live with that. If the problem was when it goes so overboard like this number that and it becomes so glaring 
that you wonder if the juice is worth the squeeze, which clearly on Wednesday it wasn't because they got completely and utterly dominated uh, on, that, on that part of the court. I think we should probably, in some ways, set ourselves up for a season where the Nets in the aggregate are losing this battle. I do want to make sure we're looking into like what gains they can get by, you know, maybe not selling out completely on the defensive glass just to make sure that they're getting guys out in transition. Let's make sure we're keeping an eye out for stuff like that. Let's make sure we're, you know, understanding if they're choosing to push the pace rather than making sure they secure every single defensive rebound that maybe there is some kind of quality trade-off for the Nets. I'm not sure. I think that's going to be something we're going to have to look at. I think it's going to be something that we're going to have to watch. Obviously, a lot of Nets fans' worst fears are confirmed with this first game, with this first one, where it's like, oh, they're just going to, it's going to be another season of just the opponents completely demoralizing the Nets with the second chance opportunities. <laughs> if you were already on that train, you're not off now. You're still very much in the group of the Nets need some kind of other big body. As a reminder, Though we with the Nets had this guy and Andre Drummond, was it were there Andre Drummond, Drummond moments that we liked? Yeah, of course. Like there was times when he looked totally dominant on the glass, and you love to see it. There were times when he looked totally unplayable, like in the playoffs. Everyone always conveniently forgets this when they want to sign some old slow lumbering center uh, to the to the roster so that they can you know sleep good at night, knowing that the Nets secured a few more rebounds and gave it up in every other aspect of the game. Like if that's the, the little security blanket that you need. Okay. I get it. I guess. Well, I don't, I mean, I wouldn't do it, but you know, I, you, I, I'm sure we're going to continue hearing from all of these folks. And the first game of the season doesn't help, you know, our stance, which is that I don't, don't want to add any of these guys. Obviously when it gets, you get completely just like almost like, you know, what's the equivalent of getting run out of the gym, but on the glass, like you just get completely swept out by Jonas Valanciunas and Zion and all these guys. And, easy second chance points and you're not boxing out and they're not, you know, they're mistiming their jumps or they're mistiming their positions and they're not understanding where the opponent is. Some of those things are correctable. Like that's going to be, we the Nets have to just figure out ways to correct that. Now, again, we talked about it last night, but some of that rebounding dis disadvantage was just down to tech technique and laziness. <laughs> technique and laziness can do you really, really dirty in one game or over the course of a season, if you're just not willing to like do the little things to make sure you secure the rebound, like box out, like understand your assignment, like clearing the path. So, you know, a, a box out clearing the path. So guys like Simmons can get the rebound. So guys like even like Kyrie can get rebounds and start to push the pace. So I'm not, I'm never going to be in the sign the Dwight Howard camp. We know this. I hope that I'm not forced to mention it every single episode from here to the day we go off locked on nets. Uh, it feels sort of like that's where we are. But, and again, one game here doesn't do me any favors. And people have had no problem mentioning this to early and often uh, for us. But I'm just still not totally sold that that's the answer. And I think that even if it was the answer on this one small part of the game, or maybe a big part if you view it that way, that the losses you would take in nearly every other part of the game would be just as bad defensively offensively like all these other places where these big guys there's a reason that they're still on the waiver wire here it's because other teams see it too and in the current form of the nba a lot of these guys just don't really have a place so get killed on the defensive glass um could be something a sign of things to come i think this one team is particularly really great at it so it was not a you know for in terms of matchups this is you know not exactly where you wanted to be probably going to turn out that the Pelicans are amazing at this all season because they have elite rebounders and super live bodies like Zion who just are, you know, unique sort of unicorn talents when it comes to this. I think that you'll start to see this even out just because of the difference in teams that they play. And for one game, it did not look all that good. We're going to uh, here in a second, going to talk just about some of the things I was a little confused about in terms of rotations when it comes to who the Nets threw out there and specifically who Steve Nash through out there, take a quick break, and we'll talk about that in a second. All right. So one thing that Adam and I discussed on the uh, post game that we did it in uh, uh, that we did in more in YouTube than we did in in terms of uh, actually on the podcast, which was discussing you know, who the Nets ended up actually playing 
<laughs> in terms of rotational minutes. And I was just all still remain very confused about why Edmund Sumner played so many minutes in this first game. He played 19 minutes. He obviously did not play a ton in the preseason just because of the way uh, that it sort of shook up for him in terms of inch. It did not look very good. Maybe they thought they needed his length. Maybe they thought that they just needed, I don't know, whatever they have seen in practice from him. I think that in time, it's going to come here for Sumner. He entered at the 530 mark in the first quarter. He was basically part of that first rotation. He came in for Kyrie. Uh, I don't think Kyrie was in foul trouble at that point. Um, no, he was not. So it was really seemed like part of the plan for him to come in and play with that first group. He replaces Kyrie. And uh, it's kind of like right after Patty Mills had come in. So it's like Pat Mills and Sharp come in for Simmons and Claxton. And then Edmund Sumner comes in for uh, for Kyrie. So it's the group of Mills, Sharp, Sumner, um, uh, KD, and uh, Royce O'Neal. And that's the first group. I thought Sumner looked pretty overmatched here. The game looked like it was moving way too fast for him. Um, it, obviously, the three-point shooting for him has not come around. That's going to be really important or really pretty critical thing probably for him to be able to at least hit some threes in, in, in terms of live game action for him to be, I don't know, a really useful player. I like Sumner. I think it's a signing that's going to end up working out. I'm just surprised at this early in the season, considering how little he played in the preseason, even with Joe Harris out, even with Seth Curry out. It's a little surprising to me to have him, just be part of this the quarter like 1.5 rotation right the after right at a minute after the first group comes in for him to be part of it and it's not like what you saw on the court helped make you feel all that better about it like the handle looked not that great the shot was pretty far off i mean one was like a kind of end of the shot clock contest so it's hard to give him too many problems for that he had three turnovers in in terms of his minutes and just in 19 minutes ended up going two for five but some of that was garbage time near the end didn't get to the line not going to kill Nash totally for this but I, I do wonder about why that was like why it was like Sumner over Thomas unless you're just worried about the length unless you're just worried about New Orleans specifically that did strike me as a little bit of a weird move I would be interested to see what happens here against the Raptors uh, on Friday the Raptors are going to be another their sort of problem team in terms of their length. Now the Nets are a long team, at least for their starters also. So it's not like they're just, you know, running some super small lineups out there anymore. But I do wonder in terms of like what we're going to see in terms of rotations, if the length gives the Nets problems again, I, I are we going to see another kind of minute share like this for Ed and, and then some, there's only one way to get you into game shape and into game speed. And that's the play. So I get that. It was just a head scratcher for me at the time. And I wa wanted to bring it up. I, by the way, this would have been a head scratcher for me if he had played really well too. I, I think I would have still had, maybe I wouldn't, it wouldn't have looked as bad, but I would have been surprised because it made a note right at the time. I was like, wow, some there in really quick after the kind of shortened preseason and off the injury, having sat out the whole year, this was you know, sort of surprising to me. Um, I'd be curious to see if you, if you need his you know, kind of quasi length at the guard position, then Toronto is another game to have that happen in because of how they trend across their front line. They're playing, you know, no one's super huge. Not, they didn't start a traditional center. They started Van Vliet, Gary Trent, OG, uh, Siakam, and Barnes. So whoever you want to label the five there, Siakam, I guess, although I guess you could call it Scotty Barnes, the – it's a long team if they do not have the same overall size as New Orleans. So if that's the case and you want to get some, at least like a longer defender and more of a live body in there, we could see more minutes coming from something there uh, in this game. And like I said, just surprised. Desperately need Joe Harris back. Not sure that's going to happen as of this recording. We have not heard about whether that's going to happen for him. Would love to have him back or, or Curry back to be able to stretch the court uh, in terms of what the Nets really need. They were desperately missing a floor spacer in this game. Although when you have Simmons, Kyrie, and KD, you should be able to do enough to probably make up at least marginally for not having one of those guys. And that's just kind of where we are. So we'll see. I, I, I'd be shocked, actually, if we saw Daron Sharp again off the bench as quickly. I think they'll probably go with maybe some smaller lineups because they're not contending with the overall size that they were dealing with from the Pelicans uh, on Wednesday night. And 
if they actually choose to go with Sharp here early to maybe try to take advantage of the size on, on both ends of the court, then I think that'll be really telling to see how these rotations are going to be. But I wouldn't be shocked to see like maybe a little more Markeith Morris in this game. Maybe old friend Yuta Watanabe gets in against his former team. Uh, those are just going to some things we're going to be watching out for with this game against the Raptors on Friday. All right. Reminder, we are going to be in uh, YouTube live. Make sure you subscribe over on YouTube. We'll be in YouTube uh, going through the game uh, post game Friday, likely win or lose. So make keep an eye out for that link or just make, make sure you like and subscribe to it with notifications on to Locked on Nets on YouTube. You get that going. Make sure you like and subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen. These are two totally free ways to help the show cost you nothing. It's just a simple click. And that is all you need to do to help the show. And like I said, that stuff really, really helps. That's just the the way it is with the online world with it, when it comes to content. This stuff is free for you. We want to keep it that way. We'll always keep it that way. Uh, but you just got to help us out by subscribing on YouTube, subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts. It's right around now that I remember that Adam likes to finish the show with a quote. Uh, I never get to that point. So just assume that it's Adam saying something from one of the great American poets. We'll be back again. Next week, talking more Brooklyn Nets basketball.